today for some virtual vitamin Z at the Detroit Zoo. My name is Claire and I'm a curator of education here for the Detroit Zoological Society where we are celebrating and saving wildlife. And today I am in the National Amphibian Conservation Center and I have the privilege of introducing a relatively new species to the National Amphibian Conservation Center. So let's take a quick little walk right over here. And this is Ryan. Hi, Ryan. Hi, good morning everybody. Ryan is one of the amphibian zookeepers, so he is responsible for the care of many of the amphibians that are here in the National Amphibian Conservation Center. Correct. So that's frogs, toads, newts, salamanders, cecilians. Did I get them all? You got them. Yes. Yep. Salamanders right. too. <laughs> <laughs> so today we are going to be zooming in here on the fringe leaf frogs. And they are a relatively recent arrival to the Detroit Zoological Society. And let's get settled down here so you can see these amazing frogs. So how long have we been providing care for this group of frogs? So like you said, this group is relatively new to our care, um, but they've been in our care for roughly around three months and in about one month total uh, here at the NACC. They were in quarantine before they got here. Okay, and how many frogs, uh, the fringe leaf frogs, are in this group? So we have a total of four animals. There's two males and two females. Awesome. And if anybody has questions about the fringe leaf frogs, please feel free to type them in. Um, we'll do our best to get to as many as we can during the live feed and anything that we don't get to um, we can address later. I'm going to back up just a little bit because this is auto adjusting the focus. I want to make sure that you guys can see without it doing that. Um, so do these fringe leaf frogs have any unique care needs? Uh, they do. So all the amphibians here have their own uh, but uh, this species in particular uh, lives in the, high up in the canopy in the Amazonian lowland rainforest uh, so they really like dense tree cover. They like lots of tall trees um, and that's where they spend most of their time so when we were designing this habitat we we wanted to create almost like a, a, a rainforest-esque uh, aesthetic with tall trees and lots of really broad leaves as you can see they spend most of their time on the top of the foliage there so in addition to the uh, mist uh, the misting system that uh, goes off for these guys we also rain on them every once in a while to uh, simulate natural rainfall which the animal prefers to breed in um, so lots of different things go into making this habitat suitable for, suitable for this species. So what logical society, what is their staple? A little picky in the sense that they like bugs that climb up. <laughs> uh, so they'll eat uh, various crickets, uh, cockroaches, uh, flies uh, of various species. Uh, so we try to offer them a variety throughout the week. Okay. So how did you guys, how did the amphibian team decide like how you're going to prop and how you're going to make this whole habitat. I mean, this is really elaborate. I'm going to back up just a little bit so everybody can see the whole habitat space. I mean, there's a lot going on in this space. How did you decide what was going to be included and what wasn't? So a lot of what we decided to do with this was based on uh, observations that our director, Dr. Ruth Marsek, uh, noticed in uh, Peru where she actually saw one of these species. Uh, and we just did the best we could to replicate what she saw when that, where that amphibian was found. Um, not a whole lot is known about this animal because like I said they live really high up in the canopy so they're hard to observe um, but we do know what their habitat looks like and we know where they're spending their time so we just basically we took an image uh, we did some uh, parameters for temperature and humidity levels we monitor the rainfall throughout the year so we took all of that and put it into what you see right here and so the I plants are still growing too, the plants so. are still <laughs> yeah. fell in a little bit more yes um, so I've had the opportunity actually to travel down to the Amazon many times with the adopt the school program and some of the conservation work that we do down there, including traveling with Dr. Ruth out into um, areas of the rainforest to look for amphibian awesome. species. And I have to say this looks phenomenal. It looks a lot like it would out in the rainforest. I want to point out a special plant here in the back. Let's see if I can zoom in on that. Okay. Um, right in the back there, and I'm going to kind of point to it. And those are really important parts of the amphibian life cycle, especially up in the treetops. Um, water collects in those leaves, and that's a great place for these arboreal species that live up in those treetops. So I love the fact that we use, use them. Yep, they like them. So speaking of tadpoles, are we hoping that these group of four will reproduce and lay eggs and have tadpoles? Yes, yeah, so as a matter of fact, um, within the first week we introduced these animals to this habitat, they actually reproduce for us just like we were hoping they would. So we currently do have a group of tadpoles, roughly 12 individuals that we're rearing in the back. Um, and uh, they laid right where we expected them to, which was on a piece of 
uh, fallen wood overhanging a water source. So they behaved just like they would in the wild and it was beautiful to see and the, the clutch was perfect. So. so they have some kind of unique coloration. They blend in really well to those leaves and that's for protection from predators I'm assuming. You got it, yeah, and that's actually where they get their name. Uh, their hind limbs uh, mimic a leaf that has been chewed on, maybe by an insect. Um, and then the coloration on their back mimics lichens that would grow on the top of the uh, surface of a leaf. So they're very well camouflaged during the day. So do the frogs have individual personalities that you've noticed? Is there like one of them that always eats the insects first or one that likes a certain spot or anything along those lines? Oh, it is interesting. There always seems to be one or two animals that are separate from the group. Um, but these animals are nocturnal, so we don't really get to see the intricacies of their personalities, so to speak. Um, but there has been uh, a specific couple, a pair of frogs that um, have been, um, amp that have amplexed uh, twice. So we know they like each other, but that's <laughs> about all we can tell you um, so far with this group. And they spend all their time, the four of them, on this habitat together. They do, yep. And then I was also noticing earlier, there's another species of amphibian that they're sharing this space with, and there's actually one right here in the front. Yeah. Just really quick, which the, what these guys are. These are called smooth-sided toads or spotted toads. Um, also, an Amazonian lowland species, um, and uh, they basically thrive off the same requirements that uh, the uh, fringe leaf frogs do, um, despite the fact that they are a toad. But just as you see, they're going to forage throughout the leaf litter uh, and the forest floor of the Amazonian rainforest. So, um, and they do also utilize a lot of the same features. Um, that the, the frogs do. The only difference being they are a toad and they are diurnal, so they're active during the day. Fantastic. So is, are the French leaf frogs, um, when I was looking them up, it seemed like they were least concerned, which means that the species is not threatened or endangered. Um, do we know that for sure, or is this one of those species that we really don't have enough information yet to really make an accurate call on how many are out there? That's a good question, a uh, good point. So. Um, I might have mentioned earlier, if not, this species is rather um, difficult to observe um, in captivity, and, or I'm sorry, in the wild. And it wasn't until last year that they only recently discovered this species range is about 140 miles northeast longer than what we thought it was. Um, so while that may or may not be true, we can't say for sure because we don't observe, they haven't been observed as much as they should be. Um, because of their difficult, their arboreal nature. Um, but what we can tell you is with the rapid deforestation happening in South America, we can infer that the populations are declining as well. Although we can't be for certain because again, they're hard to find, they're hard to get a hold of. So this is something that Ryan and I were talking about just before we went live on Facebook this morning is when I go to look up some species of animals, I can find just like pages and pages of information about them. But the fringe leaf frogs in particular, there was like two sentences here and like two sentences there. Um, so it really leads to some of the reason that the Detroit Zoological Society is down in the Amazon doing some of these am amphibian population counts. Um, so Dr. Ruth and her team will go out into different areas of the Amazon that haven't been really well researched for amphibians and just document what species they see. So we'll go out with a camera, um, we'll literally take pictures of any amphibians that we see along our night hikes and morning hikes and day hikes and then document all that information and we share that with um, the larger community, um, so it's not just us benefiting from that, that knowledge gained, but the entire um, zoology community and conservation community. Very much. So, Ryan, may I ask you what brought you into the zoology field? How did you end up sure. being a... <laughs> yeah, this is one of those instances where uh, I'm a kid that never grew up. I mean, <laughs> I grew up in the woods, I had a home in the woods, and frogs were just a big part of my childhood. Um, and then in later years, um, I learned about the... Uh, the uh, decline of amphibian populations all over the world, which has only recently been getting media attention. Um, and I was kind of a call to help for me. It was a no brainer. I want to make a difference with the frogs. And, um, and so that's what brought me here. So do you have any advice for someone who might be going into or might be interested in going into a career like yours? Yeah, 100%. Um, you have to love it first and foremost. It has to be your passion. You have to live and breathe it. Um, Internship is the, is the most important thing, is hands-on experience and learning from professionals. Uh, get your foot in the door, work for free for a while if you can. Um, and then your education, of course. Uh, get a four-year degree and some sort of wildlife uh, sciences, biology degree. Um, uh, those are all very important things. To, uh, but most, most importantly, you've got to love what you do. You've got to love this. 
That is the consistent message because I ask that question on most of our live interviews, and that's the consistent response. Is you have to love what you're doing. It's so the truth. Can't be overemphasized. It's a job of passion for sure. That's true. All right. So thanks for joining us this morning. We learned a little addition here to the National Amphibian Conservation Center. Um, and just a reminder that many of the species that you see out here on habitats um, where our guests can view them, there are many more that are behind the scenes that Ryan and his colleagues are caring for, um, assurance populations and making sure that some of these species don't go extinct. Um, so this really is a conservation hub, um, really focused on ensuring. Thanks for joining us this morning. Um, if you're looking for some more virtual vitamin Z, be sure to check us out at DetroitZoo.org. We have more videos like this one. Um, live lessons and live cameras that go into some of the different animal habitats. So be sure to check it out. All right, until next time, everybody, stay safe and take care of each other. Thank you.